Okay. Good. Thank you, Wes. Yep. So, uh, so we're going to record this and let me share my screen. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about pacemaker problems. Sorry, I just need to move this. Um, I'm move this chat box. Um, we're going to be talking about pacemaker problems and treatment. And I am by no means an expert on this. Uh, I um, this is a lecture that um, came from uh, one of our physicians in our group at the University of Utah, Dr. Scott Youngquist, and. Uh, he is he is very very good at EKGs and um, and he he gives his uh, his regards and and is sad that he cannot make this meeting uh, he just had a conflict um, but he gave me permission to go ahead and share his lecture so I will um, try to share his knowledge with you guys uh, and hopefully we can all learn a little bit more about pacemakers because I am not very good um, uh, with with pacemakers myself so. Uh, the objectives of this lecture, we're going to want to be able to identify basic types of pacemakers and what, uh, from their uh, EKG, uh, know what happens when we take a ring magnet and apply it to a pacema pacemaker, understand the appearance of pacemaker sensing failure, understanding appearance of pacemaker capture failure, formulate a differential diagnosis for pacemaker-mediated tachycardia, and describe pacemaker syndrome. So a lot of, a lot of uh, objectives, and we'll see what we um, can get to um, in, in our time frame. So I'd like to start off with uh, case number one. Hello, Dr. Howe. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay, you're okay. <laughs> sorry. Thank you for being able yeah, to yeah. join. Yeah, good to see yeah, you. Thank you very much. So um, the uh, first case is we have an 84-year-old with dyspnea, and this is her EKG. And by this EKG, we know that the, what can we tell that this patient has by this EKG? Do they have a pacemaker or no? I guess is the question. Pacemaker. Yes, there is a pacemaker. Yeah, this pacemaker, yes. Yeah. Spy, we see, uh, we see spy before yep. uh, PRS. Yep. Yeah. Yep, so we see a spike before a QRS complex, yes. but then we yes. also see a spike before a P wave, right? Yes. So we see two, two pacer spikes. Um, and when we see these two pacer spikes, one before the P wave and one before the QRS, then that can tell us, let's see, oops. Well, um, two, oops. we see. Yeah, we see two, right? Two spine, so two yeah. when, when, we look at, when we look at EKGs like this, we wanna ask ourselves, what is the pacing rate? What is being paced? Um, if the ventricle is being placed, where do the leads appear to be? And then we want to ask ourselves, is there any problems with sensing, any problems with capture, and any failure to pace when the pacer should be pacing? So any patient that has a pacemaker when we get their EKG, those are kind of the questions that we want to try to answer to the best of our ability. So with this, with this patient, what kind of pacemaker is this? Well, we see spikes before a P wave and we see a spike before um, a QRS. So the, so, um, and, and the arrows are pointing to that, right? So this is an AV sequential pacemaker. So we have, um, we have the uh, pacemaker delivering uh, uh, an impulse to the atrium and to the ventricles sequentially. So there's a pause in between there and that simulates the AV node and the pacemaker adjusts timing of response to the heart rate. Your ventricular rate. So we're gonna say probably between 100 to 150. Uh, 150. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty, pretty close, pretty fast. Yeah, our, so QRS, fast. our QRS is wide. So that is due to the ventricular pacing. Anytime you pace a ventricle, by itself, you're going to have a wide, um, uh, a wide QRS, and the 
uh, it, it is suggested that there's an RV, the, the placement of the lead is in the RV. And the way we can figure that out is by um, a negative QRS in the anterior leads and a positive one in lead one. So similar to a left bundle branch block. Yes. So that's how we know that RV, that the lead is placed in the RV. Okay. There doesn't appear to be any sensing problems. So meaning the pa no pacer firing without um, respect to the native or paste complexes. So we're not, we're not seeing the pacer fire when it shouldn't be firing. Um, there does not appear to be any problem with capture. We don't see pacer spikes without producing a P wave or a QRS, right? Every pacer spike has a P wave and every pacer spike yes. has a QRS. So no problems with capture. Yes. And there's no failure to pace when the pacemaker should be, um, should be pacing. Mm -hmm. So right now, this is either, so this is a pacing, rating, pacing rate of 145 in AV sequential pacemaker. And we are either experiencing overdrive pacing or a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And so we don't know exactly which one um, depends on the, on the patient's uh, kind of the appearance in, in case. Um, but uh, this would be a scenario where you may consider if the patient is unstable, um, providing a uh, magnet over the pacer to reset it to a, um, uh, a sequential pacing mode and basically just pacing at its um, factory default. Um, and that's different based on, the, on where the pacemaker came from. So pacemakers, um, our indications for these are bradycardia, certain tachycardias, and then something called cardiac resynchronization therapy for patients that have congestive heart failure and a bundle branch block. Um, so there's two basic components. We have a battery generator and, uh, and then uh, the generator and then the casing. Um, so many of these patients, right, you can just feel their, their, um, their pacer subcutaneously. And then we have the wire electrodes. So the, the pacemaker artifact, just know that it may not be seen in all leads. Uh, so in EKG, you should be able to see at least in one of the leads in the EKG. But um, say if we just had like a rhythm strip of lead two, well, we don't see any pacing or pacer spikes in there, but we know there's a pacemaker because we see the pacer spikes in the other leads. It's just not picking up in lead two. Um, so um, it's just important to kind of get a EKG in these patients and not just rely on the on the telemetry. So here's how um, pacemaker coding works. Um, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but uh, just know that um, there's, there's many different types of where the pacing, the pacing chamber, the sensing chamber, and the response to sensing. Um, those are kind of your three big ones. Um, and know that at least in the United States, the majority of our pacemakers are going to be the dual, um, dual pacing, dual sensing, and um, they both are uh, triggered and inhibited by, um, by sensing. Um, and then the programmability, uh, so there's something called rate modulation. So these are the very newest uh, pacemakers, and these uh, will uh, increase the rate uh, of the pacemaker in response to exercise. They pick this up by either um, uh, sensing um, movement or minute va ventilation. Uh, and so some of these pacemakers will actually vary the rate instead of having a very set rate, um, they'll vary the rate in response um, to the patient's condition. And then uh, and if you had a uh, AICD, um, then, um, then this would, they have a, uh, Kind of these anti tachycardic um, functions as well. So um, just be aware of that. So this, uh, there, there are some, uh, some pacemakers that are entirely subcutaneous. I've never seen them. So that means like the wires and everything are subcutaneous as well. Um, they, these, I think, have more problems with uh, failure to sense and capture since it's not um, directly in contact with the uh, with the cardium, um, but uh, theoretically, they would maybe have less risks of having uh, a, a wire um, uh, a wire misplacement or um, perforation of the myocardium since it's all um, subcutaneous. 
So here's an example of fixed uh, pacing mode. Um, so as you can see, we have um, a very regular um, fixed pacer spike um, in the EKG. Um, so uh, indicated by the arrows. Um, so this is uh, so a fixed pacing mode. Um, so it's going to deliver that every at every interval that we see. Um, and uh, so we have the we have the pacing interval, and then we have an escape interval. So the pacing interval is basically when the pacemaker delivers uh, the impulse to generate a QRS. And then the uh, escape interval is the time frame in between where a native beat may appear. Um, and so the native beat will be uh, different in appearance to the pacing beat. So in here, we see a, um, a wide QRS during the pacing interval. Um, and then during the escape interval, if there was a native beat, then we have a more narrow QRS. And um, usually that QRS will have a different, um, uh, different uh, like positivity or negativity um, than, the, than the pacer. So um, with demand pacing, uh, the um, native electrical activity uh, will inhibit um, the pacing during, um, uh, during that escape interval. So if there's a native beat, uh, because the, the pacemaker senses that native beat, it will inhibit um, another pacer spike from, from uh, occurring so that you don't have pacers on top, uh, a pacer beat and a native beat on top of one another. So in order for this to be success, successful, they need, it needs to have a sensing period. Um, and so it needs to be able to sense uh, the, that native beat um, and, uh, and between the uh, QRS, there's a, uh, between the, the, the pacemaker that has, um, if they've delivered a beat, then there is this refractory period, right? Where the, the myocardium can't, um, can't conduct another beat. So there's that refractory period. And then after that refractory period, there is the alert period where it senses for that native beat. And if there is, then it won't apply a, a pacer spike um, on that. So there's no sensing during the refractory period. So um, the ECG patterns of, of a pacer firing, uh, again, it's this sharp, very, very sharp vertical spike, but just know that it may not be seen in all leads. It's definitely best seen in precordials. Uh, and uh, sometimes it cannot be seen in any leads. So if there are some bipolar pacers, they're harder to see. So as we saw in the very first case, there's atrial pacing. So it's a small spike before a normal P wave. And then there's ventricular pacing. Majority of time, it's the right ventricle that has the um, lead. Uh, and so that's the majority of pacemakers. Um, and when there's that right ventricular lead, it'll produce a left bundle branch-like morphology. So negative QRS vectors in V1 through V6 and positive in lead one. There is something called biventricular pacing. Um, and this is uh, related to cardiac resynchronization therapy. So the indications for this is, is uh, um, congestive heart failure if they have um, uh, maybe an intraventricular conduction um, uh, delay or um, if they have a bundle branch block. And this improves your um, CHF symptoms. And they've shown that these pacers um, reduce hospitalizations. Uh, and so, the, so both right ventricle and left ventricle are being um, uh, are being paced with these biventricular pacers. And with these, you, sh you may see um, a right bundle branch pattern on EKG or even a narrow QRS. Since they're both firing at the same time, um, if uh, those, are, those are the patterns that you can see. So if you see a narrow QRS pattern, um, think that the, and if the patient doesn't know like, oh, I don't know what kind of pacer I have, very likely they have um, one of these biventricular pacing um, uh, pacemakers. So uh, this is a 54-year-old. Uh, he has an EF of 30% and a left bundle branch block. So we can see how his uh, wide his QRS is. 
because the ventricles, right, they don't fire synchronously um, due to the left bundle branch block. So um, this makes the congestive heart failure worse in this patient. So left bundle branch block with CHF, they're generally gonna have worsening um, of their CHF. So this is after he uh, received a um, biventricular pacer. Um, and so uh, the QRS, we see the QRS is very, it is, has been narrowed quite a bit compared to this one. You see the difference? We also see the, the pacer spikes. So the QRS has been narrowed. Um, and then we see more of this right bundle branch block um, pattern. Um, and so uh, this is uh, kind of an example of cardiac resynchronization therapy with a bi biventricular pacer. Okay, so um, what kind of uh, what kind of pacer is this? Um, so we see we see the the vertical um, pacer spike. Is it uh, before or um, uh, after a uh, cure? So it's so we see majority of them before QRS and the P wave, right? So we see these pace beats, right? And they, um, afterwards we see a P wave and that P wave is conducted. So the, the, it's the native P wave that's actually conducting to generate the QRS. So this is not a, um, this is just an atrial pacer. Um, and um, so just an atrial pacemaker. Does that make sense? From the prior one, we saw two pacer spikes and there was one before P wave in the, um, in the ventricle. So we're, um, uh, it's a, a dual sequential um, uh, pacemaker, whereas this is just the atrium. And so we're um, stimulating the atrium, we get a P wave, and that P wave is conducted through the AV node. So we don't have any issues with the AV node in this patient, their native AV node. Just so you know, there is a um, right bundle branch in this um, patient um, with that pattern. So let's take a look at this one. Um, so what kind of pacemaker is this? Well, we see our pacemaker spike and where is it relative to the P wave? So there's just one um, per, per QRS complex. So it's not a dual sequential um, and it's after the P wave. So, the, so there's a P wave or, or sorry. So, yeah, so the P wave is before the pacer spike. So there's probably an issue, right, with, so the, the patient's um, atrium is normal, but maybe they have an issue with their conduction pathway, the AV node does, is, is blocked or something. Um, so uh, what's happening is the pacemaker is sensing the native atrial activity and then pacing the ventricle. So it's a ventricular pacemaker. We also know this is a ventricular pacemaker, right, because there's a wide QRS and a um, left bundle branch um, uh, morphology. So the, the, the lead must be in the right ventricle. So the left bundle branch block, um, so that means it's more in the, the lead's gonna be in the right ventricle for the ventricular pacemaker. Does that make sense? Is there questions on that that I can answer? Pacemakers are really hard. Um, and uh, you know, if I, if I misspeak during this lecture, definitely call me out because I'm not, again, I'm not an expert, but this is from what I understand. This is, um, and, and this seems to make sense, um, right? Okay, so we saw uh, an atrial um, pacemaker, um, and then we saw a, uh, a uh, ventricular pacemaker that was atrially sensed. And now we've got this. Well, what kind of pacemaker is this? So we see, we see pacer spikes before the QRS. Um, so there's definitely a, um, a ventricular, uh, this is a ventricular paste. Um, I don't see a pacer spike before a P wave, but I also, I see these other secondary pacer spikes. Um, specifically, if you look in, uh, in V1, um, uh, and, and V2, you see this, this second pacer spike that happens 
afterwards after the QRS. So, um, so it's ventricular pacing, but then we have these native beats um, that occur, right? So we have these, um, these different beats. So we can see those by the star. So these native beats are, are narrow um, and they do not have a, um, a QRS. So there's a pause. So these, these native beats, when they occur, it causes a pause in the, in the pacemaker, right? So the pacemaker not, um, um, is, not, uh, is not firing when these native beats occur. And that's because of the, of the sensing. So we also see that there's some fusion complexes. So atrial conduction is getting, um, is getting to, through to the ventricles along with the pacing um, focus. So that's uh, by, this, by this arrow here. So there's um, a right bundle branch like morphology in the anterior leads. Um, and the question is, is that a problem? Um, and no, not necessarily. Um, so, um, but uh, if if there is a right bundle branch like morphology, then we need to consider one problem, and that is um, it can be a sign of a migrated pace relief. So, uh, so the pacer right should be uh, in the in the in the right ventricle. But if it's migrated, um, and say, let's say it's migrated um, uh, to more of the left ventricular cavity, then we, we may see this more right bundle branch block. Um, and so that, that could be a sign that, hey, maybe there's a, a lead migration. So what about myocardial infarction in the PACE patient? So I know I mentioned this before um, when, when, we were, um, when we met last week about something called scarbosis criteria, right? Because um, ST segment elevation is not going to be um, by itself reliable in a patient that has a pacemaker because of the bundle branch block. And because we already see um, a degree of ST elevation in patients with a bundle branch block. So there's something called scarbosis criteria, which looks at whether, hey, is there, uh, is there ST segment elevation and is it going in the opposite or the same direction as the um, QRS complex? If it is going in the opposite direction, then that's generally normal unless it's excessive. Um, and if it's going in the um, same direction, so if there's either ST depression going with a negative QRS or ST elevation going with a positive QRS, then that is always abnormal. And we should be thinking about um, possible myocardial infarction in those patients. So um, this is just to say that when pacemaker even, so scarbosis is helpful in, in bundle branch blocks, but um, it's even more difficult to apply uh, in patients that are paced because there's, you need native beats to identify abnormalities in the ST segment. And so T waves can be, um, can be inverted already after pacing stops due to kind of this pacemaker memory. So here's a patient um, with chest pain in a ventricular pacemaker. And this just highlights um, kind of the importance, like I, I wouldn't really be able to make much of this EKG, like, hey, is, is there maybe a little bit of concordant ST elevation in V6? Yeah, it seems like it. Maybe there's some poor concordant depressions in V2, V3. Seems like it. So maybe I'm a little bit suspicious for myocardial infarction. Um, and, and so V2, V3, we see that concordant depression, a um, little bit of concordant elevation in V6. And by concordant, right, it's going in the same direction. So ST depression with a negative QRS and ST elevation with a positive QRS. Um, but I wouldn't really be able to, I would have a hard time interpreting this unless um, it kind of highlights the importance of having a prior EKG. So this is the patient's prior EKG um, before their chest pain. And here it's pretty helpful, right? Because here we see um, quite a big difference. Um, and if you look at like the T waves in V2, V3, these are upright. This is more kind of, um, you know, a typical left bundle branch block, um, but these upright T waves in V2, V3, we switch over to this one and see the V2, V3, we, we see 
um, negative T waves along with depressions. Um, and then we also don't see that ST elevation in V6 um, or even um, the, the T wave and ST segment does look different in V5 as well. So that's, that, that just highlights the importance of um, trying to hunt down a prior EKG if you do have one, because um, it could help you make a decision. So I think after, if I saw this patient and I saw a prior EKG and they were having chest pain, I, I, would, I would alert our cardiology colleagues to um, hopefully be able to take this patient to cath lab um, very soon. So um, let's talk about these pacemaker problems. So there's failure to capture. Um, so that's where the, you have a pacer spike, but there's no subsequent complex. So you have a pacer spike, but there's no P wave afterwards, or there's no QRS, depending whether it's atrial or ventricle, uh, ventricle, uh, ventricular. And then there's failure to sense. So that's when the, the pacemaker is actually, um, uh, is firing the pacer when it shouldn't. Um, so it's not sensing, uh, so let's say there's a native beat or even the, um, the pacer beat, and it's firing that pacer spike maybe too early into the refractory period of the, of the patient. So maybe that pacer spike appears kind of right next to that T wave or even in the T wave. Um, that would be a failure to sense um, because it's firing a pacer spike when it shouldn't fire it. Um, and that will not allow, there won't be any conduction of that pacer spike because of the kind of a refractory period. And then there's failure to pace. So there's no pacer spikes and um, there's like an underlying bradycardia. So we see um, uh, these patients will be, you know, very bradycardic, maybe hypotensive, and they're, and they're, they're not, even, not even having pacer spikes. Then there's something called pacemaker-mediated tachycardia and pacemaker syndrome that we'll talk about. So what kind of failure would this be? Well, um, we do see, uh, we do see pacer, uh, pacer spikes followed by a QRS. Um, and then it's a YQRS, but we're also seeing native beats as well. So this would be kind of a failure to sense. And the reason I say that is because we can see um, down at the bottom, um, uh, these, uh, these pacer spikes that are occurring too early in the refractory period of a patient's native beat. Um, and uh, so th this, is, this is failing to sense the patient's native beats. And so maybe um, the sensing uh, is, 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 is not, maybe it's not um, sensitive enough. Um, and so it's, it's not sensing the, the patient's native beats and it's, and it's firing a pacemaker spike at an inappropriate time. Right, because we see these pacer spikes. So we see these native, these native beats. And then um, these pacer spikes are appearing kind of in this T wave. And so we don't see a, a subsequent QRS. Does that make sense? Up on the top. And then at the bottom, we can see there is a conducted um, pacer spike. So we see the actual wide QRS on the bottom. So there's, these, there's just this one that's a pacer conducted um, uh, uh, beat. But all the other ones are the patient's native beats. And the pacer spikes are kind of appearing in that T wave when they shouldn't be in the T wave, they should be um, sensing that beat and should be later because that's a refractory period of the patient. So we see these non-conducted pacing spikes during the refractory period. So that's where that arrow is pointing to. That's a non-conducted. Um, but there's one pacer that occurs outside of the refractory period and, and it's conducted and that's the very bottom one. So that the, on the, the very bottom and then the third beat is a conducted, um, conducted beat. Okay, does that make sense? Questions yeah. on that? Yeah. Very hard. Okay, yeah, it is very hard. <laughs> so yeah, um, but just just know that if you see pacer spikes and you don't see a QRS afterwards, um, you know, uh, and, and it appears within a patient's uh, uh, other QRS or ST segment then think about failure to sense because um, 
if it's in that in that period of the refractory period, um, which is inappropriate, um, they're not going to conduct, and it's not a failure to cap. It's not a failure to capture. It's because the patient um, actually can't. They can't depolarize and and have a ventricular contraction during that refractory period. So let's look at this one. Which, what kind of failure is this? Well, um, we see QRS, uh, wide QRS. We see pacer spikes right before that QRS. We also seem to see a pacer spike that occurs right before the QRS. So this would be a a dual pacemaker, right? An H root, an AV pacemaker, right? And we see the QRS, but we don't see P waves coming after that pacer spike, that initial, that first pacer spike, right? So we're having a failure to capture, in this case, of the atrial um, portion of the pacemaker. So the cure, the ventricular portion is functioning fine, but they don't have that atrial, um, that atrial kick that that um, AV um, pacer is providing because it's not, it's not uh, um, capturing that. So it's failure to capture the atria. So this patient probably will still be stable, but the atrial kick does provide, um, for, for patients, does provide a, a, you know, at least a significant portion of cardiac output. So maybe they're maybe slightly hypotensive. Maybe they're saying they're feeling short of breath or more fatigue um, because they're not picking up that atrial capture. Okay. Okay. Here is a 93-year-old with syncope. Well, we see QRS complexes and we see pacer spike before these QRS complexes. So we know we're capturing, right? Um, we just see the one um, pacer spike. Uh, so this is probably just a ventricular pacemaker. And it's going quite fast. Rate's probably like 150, 160, right? So this is probably inappropriate how fast it is. So this, this is pacemaker tachycardia. So again, is it an overdrive pacing of a ventricular tachycardia, meaning that the vent ventricles are, it's a ventricle tachycardia, or is it a pacemaker malfunction? And how do you tell? Well, again, I think it's quite difficult. And this is where I would help have uh, Scott Youngquist kind of help me with this because this is definitely not my expertise. But um, one way to tell would be to um, shut off the, um, re reset the pacemaker back to its native function. So this is where you apply a ring magnet. So um, if you apply a ring magnet to a pacemaker, then it turns it to a, what's called a fixed pacemaker mode, pacing mode. And there, that is the fixed rate is dependent on the not on the pacemaker manufacturer. So certain ones maybe will reset it to a, a pace pacer um, rate of sixty five. Some of them set to eighty. Some of them set to hundred. But either way, if you put a magnet to this patient and they go back to a um, to like the sixty five or eighty or hundred, then you can then you know that it's a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Um, and then uh, the other option is if that does, doesn't work, and the, then you can interrogate the pacemaker, and that will help you. So, in uh, this is uh, this is our very old ER. We've we've since uh, modified this ER. So I'm actually not even sure where we find our uh, pacemaker ring magnet. <laughs> But uh, it is something that you should try to keep in the emergency department. If you do have a patient that comes in with this, um, then uh, the magnet can, can help um, uh, treat the patient along with help with your diagnosis as well. Um, so again, that's just the utility of the ring magnet is assess the pacemaker capture and then treat the pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So then there's something called pacemaker syndrome, and this is concur when, um, with ventricular pacemakers, when um, retrograde conduction of the impulse to the atria occurs. So then what happens, so you, you, you have a, a, the ventricle that's paced by the pacer spine, but then that impulse from the pacer 
goes back up into the atria. So then the atria try to contract against a closed valve during systole. Um, what happens here is that you get a real, you get a sudden increase in your right atrial and left atrial pressures, right? And that makes sense, right? It's trying to conduct against a closed valve. And so that's going to cause those pressures to, um, to increase, um, uh, which can lead to, you know, problems such as, you know, uh, uh, shortness of breath, syncope, low blood pressures, um, and uh, so, so something to be aware of in, in patients that may be complaining of those, of those symptoms. Um, and, and this would be, be mostly diagnosed by, uh, by, um, uh, by interrogation of the pacemaker, but there are some EC, um, EKG findings that you can um, see. And that's, um, that's this patient. Uh, so you have a 63 year old that comes in with recurrent syncope after a, um, uh, a ventricular uh, uh, pacer placement. And so these arrows are kind of high. So we see our pacer spike before our QRS, but then what are the arrows pointing to? Well, we see this, we see, see these P complex, P waves, right? In the, in the QRS complex. And so if you were to see this in a patient that's complaining of recurrent syncope, then really kind of consider this diagnosis of pacemaker syndrome, right? Because the, the, the atrium are contracting, or we see the atria um, depolarizing in the QRS complex. So they're contracting um, and possibly contracting against a closed valve, which will cause a significant increase in pressures in your, in your atria. Do you ever see those P waves that are kind of showing up in the QRS with those arrows are pointing to? Right, and they're, can they're, they're negative in, uh, in polar, um, in their, um, in their direction. So they're net, they have negative polarization. Um, so the, uh, so that, that's also indicative of the, of the impulse that's coming retrograde. So a retrograde impulse is causing those negative P waves. Right, so we see this retrograde P wave followed by QRS complex. So cause of pacemaker syndrome. So further workup that you um, should do in these patients that are maybe complaining of a pacemaker malfunction or, or um, complaining of some kind of cardiac complaints and they have pacemakers do a chest x-ray. And we usually do lots of, uh, uh, of chest x-rays um, uh, always in patients that have any kind of complaints of shortness of breath or chest pain. So it's usually not going to be missed, but just something to always consider in your patients that do have pacemakers. Um, and they can be helpful because one, they show the ID number of the pacemaker. So every, um, every pacemaker should have a radio opaque ID number. And uh, that ID number can help you identify, hey, what kind of pacemaker is this? It can also help identify lead fracture. Uh, so if there's a fracture in the lead and it also helps reveal if there's any lead displacement. So here we can see a pretty obvious lead fracture. Right, so if a patient came in, they're um, maybe complaining of, uh, so they come in and they're very lightheaded, they're, they have a very slow heart rate. You see that the pacemaker, um, there's, there's just no, there's no pace beats at all. Um, and uh, so then you grab a chest x-ray and you see this. Well, this patient needs to have their pacemaker wire replaced um, because um, there's a fracture. And so there's nothing that you're gonna be able to do besides um, transcutaneously pacing them or doing a transvenous pacer that's going to um, mitigate their problem. Then there's something called twiddler syndrome. And so twiddler syndrome is when those wires coil up on themselves. Um, so we can see uh, by the arrow, these wires of all of a sudden started to coil around the, um, the pacer. Um, and uh, sometimes these patients will complain of maybe uh, like a, a shock in their arm or their arm or, is twitching um, because uh, there's not appropriate um, conduction to the um, myocardium. Um, with pacemaker interrogation, um, usually you're gonna have to call the technician. Um, patients usually carry the identification card of the pacemaker they have in place, but then you can also still use those radio opaque ID numbers um, if they don't have that pacemaker um, card. So another importance of getting that chest x-ray, you'll be able to know which pacemaker they have and then be able to contact um, the technician for interrogation. Now, um, when you guys have uh, patients with pacemakers, do you guys um, have, the, have the people in, in the um, 
either up on the cardiology floor that are able to interrogate the pacemakers for you. You guys know what I mean by uh, pacemaker uh, interrogation. They come down and they, they kind of run some diagnostics on the pacemaker and see what kind of rhythms they've been in, see what's been kind of going on. Do they, do they come down and do that for you guys or do you have to call in someone else? So uh, normally the cardiologist will uh, bring the patient to the, the cardiology department and they check for themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't come down to the ER to check uh, for the pacemaker. Uh, pace okay. 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 Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's the, that's the case in our department too. But um, a lot of times if we have a patient that we're, we're concerned about, hey, there's maybe something really going on wrong and they're gonna to need to be admitted. Um, they'll sometimes do it in the department for us. But it also depends on, on time of day. Yeah. So um, with pacemaker interrogation, pacemakers, they record up to um, eight high rate ventricular events for six to 12 months. Um, and then the AICDs can also record um, this data, but they record a lot more. Um, and usually when they interrogate it, they'll, they'll clear the, the memory at each interrogation session. So if they interrogate it and they say, oh, look, we had maybe like a couple runs of VTAC or something like that, um, then um, uh, they'll erase that for the next session. So uh, kind of recommendations on when to get a consult um, in patients with pacemakers. I would get a consult if the patient is complaining of any of these symptoms. Um, you know, syncope is, is a really major um, um, complaint that would always um, basically uh, inform me to get a cardiology consult uh, and get this pacemaker interrogated because uh, it's a, it could be a sign of that the patient's um, either, you know, having issues with failure to capture, maybe there's pacemaker syndrome going on, maybe they're having a ventricular tachycardia that is occurring sporadically. Um, and all these answers can be um, obtained um, with either an EKG cardiology consult and then having the pacemaker interrogated. Um, if they're complaining of palpitations, if they complain of a shock from their AICD, they should obviously get a cardiology consult and get that um, interrogated, see why they were shocked. Um, if they're having chest pain, uh, I wouldn't just say just fevers. But if the patient had a recent pacemaker placed and they started to have fevers, then I would get a cardiology consult um, because that would be worrisome for an infection. And infections of, uh, of pacemakers, um, uh, it can be, can be quite, quite deadly. Um, so uh, if they had a recent pacemaker placed and a fever, that's probably when I would get a pacemaker or get a cardiology consult. Um, if they have tenderness over that pocket where they have the the pacer place, if there's redness, looks like there's maybe signs or symptoms of infection, um, definitely get a um, consult. Um, and then any, if there's any evidence of pacemaker failure or malfunction on the EKG. Let's see what time are we at. Okay, we got 10 minutes. So, okay, so here's another case. Um, we have a 78 year old female with fatigue. Um, and so let's, let's take a look at this, um, see what kind of, what, what do we think may be going on here? A little bit difficult. The pacemaker spikes are very, very small, but um, I do see um, at least some QRS complexes with pacer spikes. Um, and then I also see a pacer spike before um, those QRS complexes. Um, and uh, so maybe this is a dual, um, dual sequence, right? Because we see two pacer spikes. But then we also see, let's look at like um, the beginning of V4, V5, V6. Um, you know, kind of, uh, we see these pacer spikes occurring. Let's see, what are they right after the T wave? So maybe in that refractory period. So maybe there's an issue with a failure to sense. Um, so that would be maybe my concern. We also seen um, patient does have some native beats. Um, so we see a native beat uh, uh, in uh, 
kind of the AVF, AV, beginning of AVF, AVL, right? We see a, a native beat there that occurs before a um, pacer spike occurs. So again, these are the questions that we ask ourselves. So what's the pacing rate? Um, so let's, let's kind of go through this. So what kind of pacemaker is this? So we got an AV sequential, right? Because we see the AV, uh, we see the atrial spike and the ventricular spike, so AV sequential. Um, pacing rate is about 75 beats per minute is our pacing rate. Mm. Um, we do see some native P waves, right? Um, so this is uh, showing up in D1. We see some native uh, P waves showing up in some of the paced uh, T waves. And then uh, we see a premature beat um, and that resets the clock for the next atrial pacemaker spike. So we, this premature ventricular contraction or whatever it is, it's premature beat. So the, it, does, it does delay the, um, uh, the pacer spike. So that's why we have this pacing gap. Um, but then, so we, we see only a couple of the atrial pacemaker spikes are succeeding in producing a P wave. So that would be the, see the blue, the blue stars. The blue stars, we see a, a capture. The red stars, we don't see a capture of the P wave. Does that, you guys see that? Red stars, there's no capture. Uh, blue stars, we see a capture. Yes. So there's intermittent failure of atrial capture. Um, all the ventricular pacing spikes do produce a QRS. So there's no issues with ventricular leads. So the QRS has a left bundle branch morphology. So where do the leads appear to be? Where would the leads be in a left bundle branch? That right or left? So it'll be on the right. So right ventricular leads will produce a left bundle branch morphology. And remember, right, right ventricular leads are the more common, um, common type. So if you see a left bundle branch block, then the um, their leads will be in the right ventricle. So uh, th this would be an AV sequential pacemaker with a rate of 75 beats per minute ventricular pacing from the right ventricle. There's no apparent problems with sensing, but there is intermittent failure of atrial capture. I don't know what this little pacer spike here is in V4, V5, V6. Um, I have to ask Scott what he thinks of that, um, whether maybe it's just an artifact or something like that, but that may be like, a, maybe just a single error of the, of the pacemaker failing to sense that prior um, duress. Okay. So that was case two, this is case three. Um, so again, so we go through all, our, all the questions. So our questions are, what's the pacing rate? What's being paced? Um, any problems with sensing, any problems with capture and any failure to pace when the pacer should be pacing? So those are the questions we wanna ask ourselves with this, with this patient. So what is being paced um, and what's our rate? Well, we see a we see a um, a, uh, a ventric. Uh, we see a spike, um, so a pacing spike before uh, our QRS. But there's a pause in between there, so that makes me think that maybe there's this is an atrial pacer um, because we see that pause, um, and uh, and it's not right next to the ventricular uh, and the uh, and the other. Other reason I think it's atrial paced is because the QRS is narrow, right? So QRS is narrow, we think probably it's an atrial paced. Um, yes. uh, but then we see um, some pacer, uh, some pacer spikes. So it looks like if you look at V2, V3, it fires a couple times. So um, fires once and then fires again because we didn't get a, a, a pacer spike. We also see a pacer spike that occurs just after that. Um, and our rate is quite slow. How, how bradycardic is this patient? Pretty bradycardic, right? So then there's the question of like, is, the, is this even um, captured at all? And I think it's probably capturing because we do see narrow QRS. If it wasn't capturing and we're just getting a ventricular escape, then we would see a wide QRS. So I think it's at least intermittent capture. 
So let's see what the, what the answer is. Oh, so they're saying this is an AV sequential. <laughs> um, so let's see, I guess there is, yeah. So there, I guess there is two pacer spikes, um, but they're right after each other. And uh, um, they're occurring at about 75 beats per minute. So, okay, so here are the, both the atrial and ventricular pacer spikes are not conducting at all. So I guess the, these, this narrow QRS is maybe coming from um, the AV node then um, with an AV, um, AV node uh, or uh, conduction, then we would have a narrow QRS. Um, so maybe that's where the, the patient's native, native rhythm is coming from. So failure to capture with this. So I guess, how do I know that these aren't pace beats? I didn't know that they weren't. <laughs> so Scott is going to teach us. Uh, so they're narrow complex beats. So um, a junctional escape rhythm is, uh, is the um, cause. So I guess the error interpretation in, in, in that for me is, is uh, thinking that this was an atrial pace and not dual sequential. But I can obviously see it now. If you look at both the pacer spikes, then it's obviously uh, a... Um, uh, an AV, um, uh, AV pacer. Uh, so then if there's an AV pacer when, when we see a narrow QRS, then they're not conducting because um, we should see a wide QRS. Uh, so this would be a junctional escape rhythm. And then I guess the question is whether the ventricular pacing tip is now embedded in the AV node, um, which it could be. But so it's an AV sequential pacemaker um, and then failure of atrial and ventricular um, capture. All right, so I think we've got time for one more case. So this is a 64 year old male with syncope. So um, we got to look at uh, what kind of pacer this is um, and what's being paced. Well, we see. Um, just one pacer spike and then the QRS complex. So this is a ventricular pacer. Um, it is a wide QRS um, afterwards and left bundle branch block morphology. So it should be in the right ventricle. Um, and then we see, uh, let's see. Um, we see some native beats that are occurring, right? So the, there's, those are the narrow QRS. So we see some native, uh, native beats. Let's kind of walk through it. So there's, um, so maybe what we were seeing before in the V4, V5 is our um, lead transition markers and not pacer spikes. So that's, I guess, uh, something to, to keep an eye on and make sure that you don't mistake the lead transition uh, markers and, but, uh, and pacer spikes. Um, your pacer rate, uh, we're seeing it to be about 60 to 75 beats per minute, uh, per minute and regular. Um, except this area, which there's no pacing that occurs in this area. And that's looks like because there's native beats. So, um, What's probably happening is there's some native beats here that's in, uh, in, uh, inhibiting the pacer, right? So we've got a couple of native beats here that inhibits the pacer. So all the pacer spikes um, seem to be conducting uh, uh, appropriately. So we see a ventricular, uh, it's a ventricular pacemaker, but then um, these pacemaker spikes do not appear to be conducted. So, um, Either it's a failure to capture, so it's failure to capture likely due to placement in the refractory period. Um, so these aren't conducted because they're in that refractory period of the patient's native beats. Um, and they occur without respect to the native rhythm. So this issue is a failure to sense. Um, and then this arrow is just kind of pointing out uh, a possible fusion beat. Um, so right bundle branch morphology, um, 
in this patient. So, um, but the PACE QRS has a left bundle branch morphology. So that's what we care about. So where the leads appear to be, so they'll be in the right ventricle. So right ventricular demand pacemaker, um, but it's having some intermittent sensing failure uh, because we can see that there's pacer spikes um, that aren't conducting and those pacer spikes are in a refractory period of the patient's native beats. So that's a failure to sense. Okay, that's all the time we have. Um, the, this, uh, this lecture is available online and I'm definitely available to answer questions. Um, if we wanna ask any questions now, or if you have questions later, you just wanna send on the chat, um, definitely send them, uh, send them to me. Thank you, Wes. It's quite a difficult topic. And as you can see, like even I, uh, and I'm not, I'm not an expert at all. I, uh, I, I, can, I can get quite confused with pacemakers. Um, and uh, it's just something that takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of looking at EKGs and looking at, um, and having a methodical approach to it, I think is very helpful. Um, so these, so I would say, if you, with any patient, maybe just try to answer all of these questions if they're, um, if they're being paced. And that may be able to help you um, with a diagnosis. Um, so just remember these questions. Uh, and uh, if you guys have interesting cases, definitely please share it with us uh, because uh, uh, share it on the share it on the group chat because we love learning from you guys too. So. Okay. This is a very difficult. Topic. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard, very yeah. hard. So. I have no experience in this, but uh, I will uh, read the uh, presentation again, and yeah. then if I have any questions, I will ask you later. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and sometimes we, we have patients with uh, you know electric storm, mm -hmm. like yeah, like a uh, patient have uh, already have pace my uh, maker and ICD, mm -hmm. but. Then um, the patient have a uh, loss of shock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they so uh, one day they uh, he the patient felt that their um, the the ICD shock uh, of like a few um less many times a day, and he went to the hospital and uh, we checked that uh, there are lots of um um. It, it turned out the patient have electric storm. Um, uh, how do how we say we, we call that is um, uh, ventricular fibrillation. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so uh, so we have to use the uh, cardiac to uh, control the the um, the rate the heart rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting case. Um, we actually had one just last year. It was a patient. Uh, we have cowboys here in Utah. Um, and so you guys are familiar with cowboys from the Western. He was a cowboy. He was a real life cowboy. Um, uh, he was um, on his horse and uh, his uh, AICD shocked him and mm -hmm. uh, shocked him off his horse. <laughs> but then it continued to shock him. Because he was mm -hmm. in uh, he was in a, a an electrical storm, so he was in refractory ventricular tachycardia. Um, mm -hmm. He got multiple doses of amiodarone from the EMS crew. He came to us, um, and then he eventually we decided to do um, um, lidocaine, um, and so we did lidocaine, and that actually got him out of the ventricular tachycardia. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, electrical storm is definitely a very interesting. Uh, phenomenon and uh, can be quite difficult to treat. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Okay. Any other questions or comments, or otherwise, I'll let you guys go. That's good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so you're very welcome. Yeah, it is very hard. Okay. Let me stop the share, and I'll uh, I'll send you this recording, Dr. Dai. Yeah, send me immediately. Yeah, after that, I upload to YouTube and everybody can, you know, view it later. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, everyone.